Good evening to our viewers in Germany and hello to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol and I'm the president of the American Council on Germany. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation about the new German government. This event is a collaboration between Atlantikbrücke, the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall, and the American Council on Germany. And we are delighted to be partnering with both of these organizations. I can hardly think of a better group than the one that we have assembled here today to talk about the so-called traffic light coalition in Berlin against the backdrop of current events, most notably the tensions with Russia over Ukraine. And I'm particularly pleased to have panelists with us from Berlin, Washington, and Los Angeles with viewers from all around the world. I have one housekeeping point before we get started. If you have a question for our panel, please post it using the Q&A function in Zoom, and please let us know who your question is directed to. We will do our best to fold viewer questions into the conversation throughout today's discussion. I'll be in the background curating questions for our moderator. And now I'd like to welcome the president and CEO of the LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall, Kim McCleary. She will introduce the panel. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you to the American Council on Germany and Atlantic Brucke for partnering on today's wonderful program. Over the last two years, we've collaborated with the American Council on Germany on a number of live streams, including with German Ambassador to the US, Emily Haber, and Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger, moderated by your chairman and our friend, Ambassador John Emerson, and also a program on Angela Merkel with Kati Martin, which you wonderfully moderated. I'm very much looking forward to today's talk on the shifts taking place in a post-Merkel Germany and hearing from this stellar panel including Ambassador John Emerson, former U.S. Ambassador to Germany, Chairman of the American Council on Germany, and Vice Chairman at Capital Group International. He will be joined by Sigmar Gabriel, former German Foreign Minister and Chairman of Atlanta Brucke. Today's conversation will be moderated by Juliana Schäuble, U.S. Correspondent at the Berlin Tagesspiegel. Berlin's biggest newspaper. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Juliana, I'll turn this conversation over to you. Thank you. And thank you to um, American Council in Germany and Atlantic Brücke to um, have chosen me. Um, I um, say hello from ICDC, where it just started to snow again. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion with two of the most knowledgeable observers of transatlantic relations. Um, I'm very delighted that apparently a very big group of you are joining today. Um, you heard if you have a, uh, have a question, please pose it via the chat, and I try to include as much as I can during our conversation. When Steve and I talked about this event today, yesterday, um, he said if we would have done this talk two weeks ago, there would have been many equally or less equally important issues. But right now, I think the one pressing issue is the crisis at the border to Ukraine. The question if there is another war um, coming up in Europe, the question is what Vladimir Putin really wants and how the two governments, um, Germany and um, the American ones, are dealing with this. Um, so let me, we have probably 30 to 40 minutes to, for this discussion, and I would just start with a question to Sigmar Gabriel. Um, we all know that governments need some time to adjust, especially when there are like three parties coming together. Um, that's why we journalists judge after 100 days um, very often. What does it mean for a new government when it has to start with a crisis of this dimension for foreign policy, um, as we see right now in Eastern Europe? First of all, thank you very much for inviting me and hi to John. I'm happy to discuss again our transatlantic relations. Um, uh, and coming to your question, I would like to start to quote the former British Prime Minister Macmillan, who once was asked by a journalist what uh, his policy, what, what, what was the driver of his policy, and, and the journalist hoped to get a, a big story uh, about the, the planning of policy in Britain, but the Prime Minister answered, events, dear boy, 
events. So what I learned in government, and I have been in government for uh, around 12 years, we always sit together as, as politicians and we think what we are planning to do and we have uh, programs and ne uh, coalition ne negotiations. But at, at the end of the day, it's always the, the unforeseeable unfore events which are testing the, um, the, 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 the capability of a government uh, to lead the country and maybe more than the own country through stormy weather. And um, this has been so with the uh, annexation of Crimea through Russia in 2014, um, the crisis at the border uh, of East Ukraine with the refugee crisis and, and many other crises as well. So governments always are confronted with un, um, um, unforeseeable challenges. And it's, it's of course, one of the, 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 the reasons why the German government for the time uh, being looks a bit, um, how, how should I say it mildly, um, not, not very active in this, in this process. But I would be happy if this would be the most important explanation for the situation in Germany. But um, I'm sad to say that it's only a mirror uh, about the, 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 uh, the, the society in Germany as a whole, because going back to the election campaign, we had three TV discussions with the three uh, important candidates with Mr. Schultz, Mr. Laschet, and Mrs. Baerbock. And journalists ask them for 300 minutes about policy. Only 15 minutes they were asked about international affairs. And these 15 minutes were only concentrated on the situation in Afghanistan. So what do you see is that this country is not really looking beyond its borders. The German society uh, is, is a society which had the luck for more than th three decades of an excellent economic development. Uh, we are concentrated on ourselves and, and we don't look really beyond borders and we don't want to be um, involved in, in, in geopolitical um, um, controversies. So that's the so the, the majority or the, the mainstream in Germany. If you would ask uh, in an opinion poll, how do Germans want to behave? I, I think we would get the answer that everybody wants to be like Switzerland, economic successful, but political neutral. Uh, that's of course possible for a small country at the, at, the, at the margins of Europe, but not for Germany. But this is the main challenge uh, for the political leadership to change the mindset in our society. And I think this is the, the, maybe the biggest challenge for the government, uh, not only in this actual crisis, uh, uh, and it's not only in Germany the case. Uh, all over Europe, my fear is that all the heads and state of government are happy that the US is negotiating with Russia. Uh, it's again the United States uh, 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 which takes responsibility for the security, for security and peace in Europe. They did it uh, uh, 1945, they did it 1989, they did it 1997. And that's, by the way, the reason why the Russians want to negotiate with the US and not with the Europeans, because they always negotiated with the United States about the, the, the uh, strategic situation in Europe. Uh, that's, that's understandable for Russia. We are happy to have a United States president who is engaging for Europe in the negotiations with Russia. But as Europeans, we should not be proud that we are only serving coffee at the negotiations in Genf, in Geneva. So I would say it's more than only a government who is in the first steps uh, after, after an election. It's a mindset where Germany especially, but a wider part of Europe is not aware that we also have to act as a geopolitical actor in Europe. Uh, and um, maybe at, at the end of my first remark, during the last weeks, I remembered myself on the first G7 meeting in Italy, 
when uh, Donald Trump was the elected president of the United States and his Secretary of State Rex Tillerson came to Italy on the G7 meeting. And we had, this was in 2017, we had the Ukraine as a topic of the agenda. And when it came to the topic situation in the Ukraine, he said, look, guys, we should, um, we should not discuss this topic because that's not something where the United States is interested in. And I think Japan as well, it's a European issue. You should discuss it uh, in the European Union, not with us. And I asked him, do you really think that this is a topic where the United States could um, abstain? And then he laughed and said, no, but I, want to sh I only wanted to show you how my president is thinking. So the question to the Europeans is, should we act in this situation that we always can trust that the Americans will take responsibility for Europe? And I would say, no, we have to take our own responsibility, but therefore, then we have to have a strong position and not a weak position against Russia. So for the time being, I'm happy that Joe Biden and Tony Blinken and others are negotiating with, with Vladimir Putin, but on the, on the longer run, I'm not very satisfied about the situation in Europe and in Germany. John, when Biden took over, the world was saying, yes, now the West is back, everything will become better, will become easier. Now there are serious doubts if Germany, suddenly Germany is still a reliable ally. Does the rest of the world still have patience for the argument that military restraint is part of the German culture? Uh, well, first of all, Juliana, it's great to see you. Thank you uh, so much for doing this and for having me. And um, hello to my good friends, uh, Steve Sokol and David Deisner and Kim McCleary. And uh, thank you, Kim, for those welcoming comments. And of course, my dear friend, Zygmar Gabriel, we could not have a better person on this panel than someone who himself was vice chancellor and helped to create a new government back in 2013, 2014. And I would remind our listeners that uh, one of the immediate crises that the you know, Merkel Gabriel coalition had to deal with was the initial Russian incursion into Ukraine, which started this war. And I think it's important for people to understand that this isn't about whether Putin will start a new war. It has been an ongoing war uh, at different levels, uh, really since, uh, uh, the spring of 2014. And I think that's very, very important. You know, uh, that's a great question. Uh, and I think the dynamics that uh, Zygmar just talked about in terms of, you know, a, a, a federal election campaign where very little attention was paid to foreign policy, um, to a public that generally goes, huh? Why are we worried about this? Why are we interested in this? Uh, those same dynamics uh, exist in the United States, for sure. Uh, and it was one reason why, at least during my time as ambassador, we were pushing Germany very hard to take more of a leadership role, particularly when it pertained to Europe, particularly when it pertained to um, events of international consequence. Uh, and really play a leadership role, not just within le Europe, but also within NATO. And I think the leadership role that Germany plays within Europe becomes even more significant in the post-Brexit era. Um, and, uh, and while we were happy in, back in 2014 to see pretty compelling speeches by President Gauck and then followed at the Munich Security Conference that year by uh, uh, you know, then Foreign Minister Frank Walter Steinmeier and, um, uh, and then Defense Minister Ursula von der Leyen about the importance of Germany taking more of a leadership role. And it would just seem to me that story with Rex Tillerson that, that Zygmar just shared with us is very, very telling. And it would seem to me that, if anything, uh, having the movement towards Germany playing more of a leadership role. And let's not forget that it was Angela Merkel who led the Minsk process, the Normandy process, took very much of a forward leaning role in trying to deal with uh, the Ukraine crisis once it first uh, arose back in 2014, 2015. Um, that uh, in the wake of the Trump administration, 
uh, that that would have been a big wake up call and saying, you know, we can't necessarily rely on uh, the United States of America always electing presidents like, uh, you know, say a, 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 a Ronald Reagan or a George H.W. Bush or a Bill Clinton or a Barack Obama or a Joe Biden who are going to take seriously uh, the role that the United States has historically played in um, helping to build and sustain and move forward these multilateral uh, institutions. And yet it seems, uh, at least um, initially, uh, that those lessons maybe haven't been learned. And, and I know there's a sense of relief, and thank goodness that uh, you know, the Biden administration is taking the lead in all this. I don't necessarily think that's good for Germany. And I'll tell you something else. It has long been a geostrategic um, objective, maybe the principal geostrategic objective of Vladimir Putin to drive wedges between Europe and the United States and, with, and within and between European allies and uh, the member states that are um, you know, part of the NATO alliance. And uh, you know, every time he sees uh, you know, reports that whether Germany officially did this or didn't, or the UK thought they might, that the UK can't fly over German airspace to, to, to honor its decision to deliver lethal aid to the Ukrainians, I got to believe Vladimir Putin is popping champagne corks. And, um, and I just think that given Germany's role in the world, the importance of its role in Europe, uh, it can't be Switzerland. Uh, and, and that would not be good for Europe. It would not be good for NATO. It would not be good for the transatlantic alliance. And it certainly is a risky strategy uh, given the fact that who knows what might happen in the 2024 elections and who might be the next president of the United States and what might drive their foreign policy. Because I'll tell you, Americans, to the extent that uh, Zygmar is talking about the German public not being interested in foreign affairs, multiply that by 10 and you got the American public. Thank you. Sigma Gabriel, one of the crucial topics um, uh, in, this, in the relationship between Germany and Russia is, of course, energy security. Um, you were a former member of um, uh, German governments, um, and the last time the a German chancellor visited Washington, D.C. in the summer of last year, we kind of had the impression the dispute on Nord Stream 2 was solved. Now Olaf Scholz is coming on February 7th, and this issue is seriously back on the table. Um, how true is the allegation that Germany has made itself dependent from Russian gas deliveries? I mean, of course, uh, Germany uh, uh, has a strong relation to Russia when it comes to, to, to gas, not so, not so strong when it comes to oil. And uh, the experience was that even in the darkest times of the Cold War, the former Soviet Union always delivered uh, uh, what they promised. So we never had difficulties with them. They never tried to press us uh, because we had these gas cooperation. And by the way, the Americans were always uh, critical about this. The first sanctions from the United States against the German-Russian gas pipeline were in 1963. Uh, then the second one in 1977. It was always a dispute between the United States and, and, and Germany. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I never uh, quoted uh, it uh, as a purely uh, economic uh, um, uh, energy cooperation like uh, uh, the, the, uh, the German Chancellor Mrs. Merkel did, because in reality, we always negotiated with Putin that uh, this uh, pipeline will only be um, built if he gives guarantees for Ukraine, not only with, a, with the, uh, the integrity of its territory, but to deliver uh, uh, gas through the trans ukrainian pipeline. This was the agreement between Merkel and Putin at the end of her period. And so it was never a purely economic uh, position. I think our American friends should understand how it came to this pipeline. Nearly 30 years ago, we had a decision in Europe um, to, to bring out the, 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 the public responsibility of states or regions or even communities for the energy security in Europe. Uh, we said, let's build a European framework and whoever works inside this framework is responsible for his own energy uh, supply and energy consumption. So we depoliticized, we liberalized the energy market in Europe. 
And of course, what, what the Gazprom and others and German and French and Italian and, and, and uh, companies from the Netherlands did is using this European framework because pipeline gas from Russia seems to them more profitable than using LNG from elsewhere. That's the history. It has to do with the liberalization of the European energy market. It was always criticized by parts of Europe. But at the end, even the European Commission said, if you are playing to the rules, then the pipeline is possible. Now the situation is that everybody knows if Putin would act in, with, with violence and with military aggression against the Ukraine again, because John is right, we, are, we have an ongoing war in east of Ukraine and Russia is responsible for that. If they would go further, then of course Nord Stream 2 is dead and maybe not only Nord Stream 2. I think we, are, we have to learn as Europeans as, as Germans the lesson that never, nobody could really predict how Russia would act in the future. My fear is that our experience from the past that even the Soviet Union always uh, delivered as they promised could be not the position of Russia in the future. So what Europe and especially Germany has to do is even after solving this crisis, even it would come to a peaceful solution in the east of Ukraine, we have to diversify our energy um, supply chain. But then we also have to say the public that this means higher energy prices. And my feeling is nobody in Germany wants to tell the public the truth. This is a consequence we have to face. But I don't think there is any alternative uh, than to dive, even if Nord Stream 2 would come into uh, ener energy, uh, um, uh, in it, into practice, Germany has to diversify its energy uh, uh, supply chain and Europe as well. That's, I think, what we had to learn during the last weeks. John, how is your take on that, on the dependence of Germany on Russian gas? Well, I, I completely agree with uh, with what Zygmar said that uh, ideally the best, you know, domestic energy policy, the best uh, foreign policy and the best national security policy uh, for Germany. Um, you know, of course, as I was ambassador, I would never dare to, to say what, what Germany's best policy should be. But now as an outside observer, I can say would be to diversify uh, and, and reduce its dependence on Russian oil and gas, you know, simply because it, we see what's we see what's happening. We see the potential for what might happen with Ukraine with that gas pipeline, and um, you know, right now uh, because Nord Stream two hasn't been opened yet uh, or brought online yet, uh, you know, it, it, the benefit is for us. We can always hold this out there as a threat that we would close it or not open it or what have you. But you could easily see that once it, it, the gas gets flowing and Germany gets more dependent on that and, and the German people start liking those lower prices more, uh, that, that that then becomes a threat that Russia can can use and hold against Germany. So I think, um, uh, yeah, that needs to be that needs to be explained and uh, the investment needs to be made. I know at, at one point Germany was investing in uh, regasification uh, facilities at uh, Wilhelmshaven. I don't know where that stands now, but that would allow it to bring in more LNG, liquefied natural gas. And of course, there's, I think, a lot of German companies that are investing in uh, the development of battery technology. So we'd have better, I mean, massive battery technology. So we'd have better storage of wind and solar uh, energy and, um, and all that. And I think, you know, just domestically, it's a little hard for one party to say, uh, we need more, you know, we need more gas, I'm sorry, we need more reliance on renewables, but oh no, you can't build those power lines to help bring the power from say the North Sea or the, or the Ost Sea uh, down through Germany to other parts of Germany where they don't have as much um, uh, wind energy. I mean, you know, they're going to have to be sacrifices made across the board, as there have been and, and will be in the United States, where we also see gas prices rising. So um, as in so far as Nord Stream 2 is concerned, you know, our opposition to that, which did start during the Obama administration, was not so much 
oh gosh, Germany, you're going to be dependent on Russian oil. It was much more, I'm sorry, Russian gas. It was much more a concern about um, that Russia would use uh, the availability of gas through Nord Stream 2 as putting its, uh, you know, it, its, its hands more firmly around the neck of Ukraine in terms of threatening to, uh, you know, turn off in effect or stop the gas transit, which in Ukraine dependent upon the gas transit fees through those pipelines. It was more of a geopolitical concern than a, gosh, Germany, this is in your domestic best interest, which never goes down well when one country tells another country that. Uh, so it was more of the geopolitical concern. I think the Trump administration's opposition, which I, I, honestly, the way it was articulated, I think was counterproductive. Anytime you're you know, the leader of one country gets berated publicly by the leader of another country to do something, they're going to be less inclined to do it because it's just going to look like they're capitulating to, uh, uh, to demands. Uh, so I think the way it was handled was counterproductive. But their arguments were much more, hey, buy the stuff from us. Uh, it was more of an economic argument than a geopolitical argument. Now we're back to uh, you know, the geopolitical um, uh, argument uh, as well. And we're, and, and then we see how Russia is behaving. I think to hear, you know, Zygmar Gabriel say, I'm not so sure that what we used to be able to rely on in terms of the word of Russia, even the word of the Soviet Union uh, in the old days, uh, that we will be able to rely on that in the future. Wow, that to me is a big red flag and a very, very compelling argument uh, for uh, Germany and other parts of Europe as well uh, to develop alternative sources of energy to just that massive reliance on Russian oil and gas. Apart from add, the climate, apart from the climate implications of all that. May I add something? Sure. I mean, first, I'm happy that that uh, John remi reminded us that it was Obama who I would say pushed the German government to negotiate with Putin about the energy security of Ukraine. And that was the reason why we had these agreement uh, with Russia that Nord Stream 2 is linked uh, to the Trans-Ukraine pipeline. Um, that, that's, that's, that, that was um, uh, the case. Second, maybe to explain why people like me and others were supporting Nord Stream 2 in the past was one of the consequences of the liberalization of the gas market and the energy market in Europe was that we came to a, a net of uh, 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 um, electricity grids and gas pipelines in Europe. Before we had sometimes only regional nets, uh, uh, maybe in, uh, nets in a country, but not in, in Europe. So we always said, okay, even if we would come in difficulties with Russia, with well, their gas uh, delivery to, to Germany we, or to other parts of Europe, we always had the, the, the opportunity to, get, to, to fill in gas on another part of Europe because the, 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 the gas uh, pipelines are uh, developed to, to a net European wide. This was only possible because in, the, in a liberalized market, you want to have the same gas price at any, any part of Europe. This was not the case at the end, but this was the target to come to a, to a, um, to a common uh, energy market in, in Europe. And so we were not so concerned about Russia in the past. That was the reason why people like me and others uh, supported, supported Nord Stream 2. But unfortunately, we see uh, that even war is possible in the center of Europe again. I mean, uh, what we had was um, a kind of, civil war supported by Russia in the east of Ukraine, but bringing 100,000 soldiers and even more at the border of a, of a European country, that shows us, look, there is somebody who thinks that even war is an instrument of politics. And in this situation, we Europeans have to, to tell uh, Russia if you will go in this direction, it will cost you a very high price, which is higher than only North Stream. Because my fear is, this is included in the Russian strategy that more North Stream maybe will not come into operation. It's a kind of superpower tax. Uh, Russia is, is willing to accept every sanction as a, as a kind of superpower tax, which they have to pay 
uh, and on the other hand, they show we are a, a global player. Uh, I think we have to do much more, and that's my concern about Europe. Are we really willing to show the Russians a price, which means that we also have to pay costs for that? Until now, only the Americans are doing this. Uh, and I think Europe has to step up. And again, I'm a committed social democrat. I, I always praised uh, the policy uh, of dialogue and and uh, Entspannungspolitik of, of Willy Brandt and others. Uh, I, I'm not an anti-Russian propagandist, but I see 100,000 soldiers in Europe and war is possible again. And that's not something where we could, uh, could accept uh, um, uh, even, even the even the, this kind of aggression against another country before they enter it, it's something which should be impossible in Europe. And therefore we have to stand up and, and, and it's impossible only to say, hi guys in America, please uh, defend our interests. It's also our own interest. Quick, quick question, because you mentioned um, you being a member of the Social Democratic, Democratic Party. There is a meeting on Monday, um, the Social Democratic Party is meeting to define the future line in its dealing with Russia. Is there a specific problem for your party with this country that is different from others? And what are we going to expect from Monday? Is there suddenly one line as to move forward? I think they will, will exactly uh, uh, decide about, uh, uh, would exactly argument at, uh, like I did before. I don't think that there is a real split in the party, but what you can find in the Social Democratic Party, and, and not only there, uh, in many parts of the German society is a kind of remembrance on the, uh, what's the English name for Entspannungspolitik? The, the, um, so the, the kind of the dialogue of, of Willy Brandt. Uh, Ostpolitik or? Ost East politic, yes. Yeah. Uh, right. So they, they remember to the good old times on the end of 60s and the beginning of 70s. And of course, many people think that uh, Germany has a special responsibility to Russia because of the Second World War. Uh, by the way, the same responsibility we have to the Ukraine. Uh, uh, that's, that, there's no difference. And there, I, th sh I think we should remind my, or I and others, we should remind our social democratic friends, what was the position of Willy Brandt at that time? His position was that nobody should have any doubts about the, 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 the integration of Western Germany in NATO, in the European Union, and what we call the West. If there would have been any doubt about the German position, Russia, by the way, or the Soviet Union would not negotiate with us. We would be their play ball, but not an actor in negotiations. And others, like the United States, like Italy, like France, and later after the fall of the Iron Curtain, if Germany would be not absolutely crystal clear integrated in the system of NATO and European Union and, 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 and an active part, then others would not trust us. And maybe by the way, the German unification would not have happened. So Willy Brandt was only successful because the counterpart in the Soviet Union knew exactly where we are. And that two pillars of strategy in NATO are on the, or, or, or have the same weight. First, the capability to de deter and to defend our own security. And the second, uh, 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 the, 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 the offer of cooperation and dialogue. Since 1963, since the, the, the famous Harmel report in NATO, NATO has always these two pillars in its strategy. Deterrence, the capability to defend, our own freedom and security, and the, the offer to dialogue and, and to cooperation. That's two sides of one coin. And I think that's the same today. Nobody, uh, th there's no reason uh, not to trust the Americans or NATO or the European Union or Germany that we are not willing to have a dialogue with Russia, that we are not willing to accept their security uh, um, uh, uh, interests, or that we are not willing to cooperate. But on the other side, everybody must know a country which is playing with war in, in Europe has to get an answer and to pay a high price. 
that's again two sides of the same coin maybe one last question uh, to ukraine from one of our viewers um he or she i'm not sure uh, said i understand that germany sent soldier helmets to ukraine to support their resistance to russia's threats to invade why can't the new government do more for ukraine and sigma Gabriel just said it what is what is the clear answer we should give i mean what what we did what we did in the last years is a massive financial economic and political support of ukraine i don't think that there are other countries in europe which did more for the security and the democratic development of the ukraine the question now is should we deliver weapons to the ukraine i'm a i'm a bit um sad that that germany's behavior is only asked on this single question do we should we deliver weapons yes or no um germany has a very restrictive export directive for delivering weapons because we in the past we thought it, a crisis will not be solved by delivering weapons but we also decided in a different way when i was in government we had to decide to deliver weapons to the kurds who were defending the the Uh, the people of Yazids in uh, in Iraq. They were attacked by ISIS, by the fundamental terrorists uh, from ISIS. And it was a big debate in Germany. Should we, against our regulation, against our, our, our position, against the law, could you say, should we deliver weapons to the Kurds, yes or no? And we decided, yes, we will deliver. Because if not, they would not be able to defend the lives of the Yazids. What you need in Germany is an open debate about this without any taboos, without any restrictions. And I think this has, has to be done in the public and in the German parliament, uh, because there is no doubt that Ukraine has the right to defend its own. Uh, the question is, do we do enough outside uh, this military issue or do we have to do more Uh, also on the military side. That's an open debate in Germany, uh, but it has to be debated. And there are arguments on both sides, which 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 I respect very much. I would, um, I, let me just jump on that one. I think, first of all, I was very happy to see the uh, providing of lethal aid to the Kurdish Peshmerga. I remember at the time that happened, I spoke uh, forcefully about how that was a big move forward in terms of Germany and very, very positive. Uh, um, and I would hope that, um, you know, as, as you suggest, Zygmar, that would then be the frame for this debate and not, oops, we, we shouldn't have done that. Now let's go back to not, not giving anything to anybody. Uh, I would remind people just from the standpoint of history uh, that in every bilateral meeting between uh, Barack Obama and Angela Merkel, which is ambassador I had the opportunity to be a participant in, Uh, during the period of time of the initial incursion in the Donbass and the Donbass war and the illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, oh, President Obama raised uh, the fact that he was getting enormous pressure from the United States Congress, particularly Senator John McCain and others, to provide lethal offensive aid to the Ukrainians. And Angela Merkel was very much, I wouldn't say pleading, but certainly uh, strong in her argument that that would not be helpful and her point was it's sort of like a poker game when you raise the bet and then the other guy goes well i'll see you and raise you that no matter what we did in terms of providing lethal aid to ukraine at that time and during that during that process um that that putin would would see you and then raise you and you would never win that uh, acceleration of, uh, of, of weaponry. And as, as a result, you would see much more um, you know, bloodshed. And that uh, she needed and wanted the diplomatic space to try to move forward with the Normandy process and, and the Minsk Accords and all that. And Obama took political heat internally in the United States, particularly from the Congress, in order to give her that political space. But And at the same time, what we were doing, you can do more than just helmets. I mean, it's helmets, Kevlar vests, it's, it's uh, surveillance uh, equipment and material, it's radio uh, communications materials, 
you know, there's a, it, it would be, uh, uh, you know, Jeeps and, and, and transportation vehicles. I mean, there's a whole lot you can do. And as Zygmar also mentioned, of course, financial aid, uh, that's short of, you know, providing them with anti-tank missiles, for instance. And, uh, uh, you know, now we've been, we've been in a different place. I would contrast this with the situation in Taiwan, where our policy has been to, you know, continue to arm Taiwan in the absence of this kind of a military threat and ongoing war, but arm them on the front end so it makes the price of an invasion just that much higher. Uh, for the um, aggressive uh, party. And, uh, you know, perhaps during the quieter time of this ongoing conflict, maybe we should have done more in, in terms of that. But I just thought it was uh, important to share that, uh, that sort of historical observation uh, about uh, how this all played out vis-a-vis -vis the providing of lethal aid uh, to Ukraine back in 2014 and 2015. Thank you. Some of our viewers are interested in the question of there's any chance um, of revisiting the decision um, to, to, um, to end nuclear power in Germany, uh, especially when you look at the government that consists of a green foreign minister, a green a minister for economic affairs, um, social democrat chancellor, um, and the, the economy friendly um, uh, FDP. What is your take on that? How is You're nuclear? Asking. If there's a possibility to go back to use nuclear power for electricity production in Germany, <laughs> no way. No way. <laughs> no way. Was no it a way. mistake? Was it a mistake to go down that road? No, I, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so because um, uh, I, I, when I was member of parliament uh, in my constituency, I signed the treaty about the only nuclear waste deposits which we have in Germany. My question to everybody who wants to use nuclear power is, what is your solution for the nuclear waste, which we will have for thousands of years? And until I don't have an answer to this question, I don't think that we should go back to nuclear. And I'm a guy who organized a nuclear waste deposit for the low and mid radioactive waste, nowhere on earth, we have a place for the high radioactive waste. So that's my first argument. Second, why should we use the most expensive kind of energy production? Why? I mean, wind and solar is much uh, more efficient. And why we should, I mean, I understand France and Britain and others who are nearly totally dependent on nuclear power uh, stations, and after 60 years, they have to re, uh, reinvest in them. I understand. I don't want to teach French uh, people how they should produce energy. But why should Germany go back to the most ex expensive kind of, of um, uh, electricity production? Every, everywhere in Germany, the United States, by the way, they are discussing since 1978 to have new nuclear power plants. There is no one. No, no, no new power plant. Why? Because you need state subsidies for that. I can't see any place on earth where somebody is able to build a secure nuclear power plant without state subsidies. So why we should go this way? And again, my question is where you want to put the nuclear waste? Well, that, I mean, that's an issue. It's interesting to me is uh, I've seen some commentary in the press around, you know, with experts in, um, uh, in terms of climate change that, you know, particularly obviously dealing with the nuclear waste issue uh, that's being hugely important, that particularly as we're moving into, um, you know, how do you deal with uh, energy production in the developing world, et cetera, that, that maybe perhaps nuclear, uh, if it can be done more safely, uh, would be a possible solution to that. Um, you know, I don't see nuclear plants getting built much in the United States either. I mean, it's just, it's billions and billions of dollars and years and years and years because of uh, just the, the legal, you know, regulatory process to get something approved, to, if, you know, on, on, then on top of that. Also, I must say that uh, my wife, Kimberly, and I have just started watching the 
uh, very late in the game on this, but the HBO miniseries on Chernobyl. <laughs> so I'm not sure I'd be too excited about uh, about that uh, from that standpoint as well. But I do find it interesting that that some who are very much green and, and involved in the whole climate initiative are saying, well, you know, maybe uh, nuclear could be an answer to this uh, if done right. And, and uh, we still obviously haven't solved the, dispose, the waste disposal problem. Thank you. you. You mentioned Taiwan already and several of us are interested, of course, in China, even though we talk about Russia um, a lot right now. Um, and the question goes into the direction of um, that Germany and Europe are aligning closer with US views on China. Um, like, like the, the problems the US sees in, um, in human rights violations, in forced labor, etc. Um, will Germany become more hawkish on other economic and trade issues, or will it be constrained by Germany's deep economic ties with China and the risk a EU China trade war could pose on a world already facing supply chain issues? Chain issues. If I would be in a, <laughs> Sorry. In a pub, if I would be in a public political debate, I now would answer, we will behave in the same way the United States is doing. Because if you this is not public, this is just us. It's a very no, no, it's, no, 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 but he's giving it's a harsh, it's a harsh answer. No, it's a harsh, no, it's a harsh answer because in reality, around 10% of the United States economy is decreasing its uh, uh, its involvement with China, 50% of the United States economy is stable, and 40% is increasing. And just some weeks ago, the United States agreed to deliver LNG. So liquid, liquid gas to China. Uh, so so I, I don't think that you can, can ignore the potential of 1.4 billion citizens in a global market. It's impossible. I think we are maybe for, for 10 years or more, we are always searching for a balance between three areas. The first area, of course, is the area of confrontation when it comes to human rights, when it comes to Taiwan, and some other issues. But the second area will be competition. Who, is, who has the better capabilities for innovation? Who is, is more efficient? The United States does not have an interest to bring China down because if China would go down, the rest of the world and the economy would also go down and the other way around. China does not, not have no interest to, to, to bring anybody in Europe on the United States uh, down on its knees, because then it would have consequences for China. In the area of economics, you will see competition, but not confrontation. Maybe not in the digital issue, there we will have a kind of hybrid globalization, but more or less, everybody will cooperate in a certain way with China. And there is an area of cooperation. How we will address climate change or pandemics, or by the way, the proliferation of nuclear weapons and nuclear technology to build weapons without cooperation with China. And that's what the, exactly what the United States is doing. They are searching for a balance between those areas where we are in confrontation, those areas who, where we want to be stronger than China in the economy and in technology, and the areas of, uh, 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 of cooperation in fields like climate change and pandemic. That's the balance we are searching as Western democracies. And therefore, by the way, we have to join hands. I was very much supporting the idea of Joe Biden, which has a bit difficult name. It's called B3W, Build Back Better World, because this is an, an excellent alternative to the new Silk Road. And I saw that the Europeans decided to have a 300 billion euro program where it's called Global Europe. My question is why they do not join both programs. But we should act together. We should give an alternative to, to the African countries, to the Central Asian countries, to the Latin American countries, uh, to the Silk Road and, and to, uh, to the support which they get from China. Because that's, that's the competition. They try to get more geopolitical influence by their new Silk Road. And I think we have to have an alternative. I was always shocked that we only blame China for having a strategy, a geopolitical strategy. I think we should blame ourselves not to have one. And now we have a United States president who has a strategy, who wants to uh, bring democracies together uh, as, as an answer to the authoritarian regimes. 
And I would say the Europeans should join and act together in a, in a, a new kind of transatlantic cooperation where not the Atlantic is in the center of our interest, but maybe more other parts of the world. And there we have to give an alternative to the autocratic uh, uh, offers of China and others. Well, let me just say, let me just say that I completely agree with what Zygmar is saying. And I've been saying much the same thing in the last year, year and a half when I speak at conferences and, and all on both sides of the Atlantic. And um, uh, just, just two little uh, nuanced points. Uh, in terms of, I, I think, it, it, you know, the Biden administration always talks about the three C's and, and I think competition has become the biggest C and part of competition is not basically leaving the playing field when it comes to one belt, one road. And, uh, and you're absolutely right uh, on that. And the idea of us doing it together, it seems to me is a perfect, uh, a perfect opportunity. The, the, the second C of cooperation, you mentioned climate change. I would also say two other areas of cooperation, nuclear proliferation, both in terms of trying to get Iran back into the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, which we recognize that was our fault because we walked away from that, our, our being the United States government, but I think China can be helpful there, and containing North Korea, hugely important to role that China would have in containing North Korea. And the third part of cooperation, I think, is in ultimately developing an international infrastructure to deal with the next pandemic when it comes up. So we don't have hide the ball, which we did have from the Chinese during the first number of weeks when this thing started to break. And we immediately get transparency and scientists into wherever, whether it's in, you know, coming out of Africa or Asia or wherever, uh, to, to try to jump on this thing very, very quickly and determine what we have and what steps need to be taken. That's another area of cooperation. The second point I would like to make is this, and it sort of gets back to the whole Switzerland metaphor. Um, I, I speak regularly, in fact, both Kimberly and I do at a conference in, uh, at Schloss Elmau in Bavaria, which I guess will be famous again with, uh, although I, I don't know, I can't imagine uh, Joe Biden sitting on that bench with Olaf Schultz talking to him the way we had that famous Merkel Obama photograph, but we'll have the, G, uh, the G7 there again, I guess this year. Uh, but uh, it's a conference that many of the DAX CEOs uh, attend, and it's a regular discussion, and I get involved in this on, uh, on, at panel, on panels about how much, you know, uh, the importance of German investment with China, the importance of German trade with China, uh, that a lot of these German companies are even doubling down with uh, their investment in China. And my refrain is obviously, yeah, that's great for today. But you're just kidding yourselves if you think we're not going to see the same kind of, um, you know, intellectual property theft and forced technology transfers uh, that we've been seeing for years. And, you know, three, five years ago, all of a sudden, all those great German auto parts that go into the Audis that are being made in China, well, they're going to have to be replaced with Chinese auto parts. And then in seven years, you're going to see a factory pop up that's a purely Chinese made car that's completely subsidized that can then be sold on global markets outselling the German cars that are being made there. So, you know, if you're going to go in there, great, but let's do it with an open eye and, um, uh, and not, not sort of uh, uh, a naive approach in terms of what we're doing with dealing with there. And I also, the final thing I would say, I remember the last Munich security conference that we had in person, which was 2020, uh, the members of the Trump administration were hammering uh, Germany and the Europeans say, do not use Huawei, do not use Huawei. To me, it's inconceivable that with the engineering uh, skill and expertise that exists in Europe, in Germany, in the United States, that we haven't figured out a way to build a consortium to do a bigger and better uh, and more cost-effective Huawei type system for building out 5G. And so I would add that to uh, as Zygmar's comment about we ought to work together on our, you know, the, the Western version of One Belt, One Road. I think we also ought to work together on some of these technology issues where, where China's, you know, getting ahead of us. Uh, we shouldn't be dependent upon, uh, you know, Huawei to build out our 5G systems. We should have our own. And, and I think with so many of these issues, the refrain is with the great global challenges we face, 
no one nation can address them alone. We need to address them together. And particularly those of us who share the values that we share in the transatlantic relationship need to come together and figure out how to address them together. That's a good um, a bridge to my last question and to one of the really big problems we are all facing since uh, uh, already three years, almost um, uh, the pandemic, of course. Um, and uh, we have a new government, we had a transition, we, had the, we have a fairly new government in, in Washington, D.C. Um, what is what is there to be done that 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 we act better together? Um, Maybe, trans maybe across the transatlantic, but also looking into the rest of the world. What, what has to be done better than you have done it last year, like uh, the last two years? If you have a wish, if you can, if you can address a wish to, to the different governments, um, what, what is there to be done? What is the biggest priority right now? Zygmar, you want to address that I first? I would say never forget the developing countries. I mean, we need around 11 billion doses of vaccine to help the poorer part of the world. And as long as the pandemic can um, develop the, in these countries without any um, um, intervention, then it could be possible that there will be a virant, uh, a new mutation of this, uh, this uh, virus, which can jump over our own vaccines. So it's in our own interest to, to do much more uh, in these countries. And the second reason is you see that China uses the pandemic as a, for, for a kind of medical uh, new Silk Road, medical new Belt and Road Road. Uh, and uh, um, the, the big difference uh, between the behavior of the West uh, and the situation uh, um, after the last crisis, the financial crisis in 2008, you can see that Immediately when the, when the crisis started, uh, uh, the financial crisis started in 2008, uh, the G20 met in Washington, had a common analysis, and then act together against the financial crisis. And I would say more or less successfully. We never had such a meeting, international meeting, when it comes to the pandemic. There was one G20 foreign ministers meeting when Trump was president, and um, it was not possible uh, uh, to come to a, a common uh, solution because they could not agree on the name of the virus. Trump said it has to be called China virus. And uh, I don't know why the Chinese did not agree. I mean, uh, there you can see the difference between 2008 and 2020 and 2022. We have a lot more international challenges, but less capabilities, less um energy for international cooperation and i would say especially the western democracies they should act more together also by fighting against the pandemic in the poorer part of the world i think the the the, the takeaway on that comment is none of us are safe until all of us are safe because we just i mean these variants they're, they're not developing necessarily in the United States or Europe. They're developing in places where people aren't vaccinated. And then they come back like that. And, uh, and then we have to deal with them. I think that's really important. The second piece, I think, is getting control. And, and this did get out of control. And I think in part the way uh, you know the leadership in this country initially handled it, contributed to that, uh, the, getting control over the misinformation. Uh, and it's really hard to do with social media out there. Uh, but, you know, the fact that um, uh, science is questioned, uh, the fact that uh, leadership is questioned, uh, we, we need to do a better job in the interim between now and the next pandemic of, uh, you know, sort of educating our populace about these things, about how they work, about how they, they move. And I also think this, this health, the, you know, Dealing with the pandemic is too important, or certainly the messaging around a pandemic is too important to be just left to the healthcare professionals. You know, we, we need, because, you know, first it was, well, science doesn't say we need masks. Oh, now we need masks. Oh, cloth masks are okay. Oh no, it can't be cloth masks, it has to be N95s. I mean, that you know, the, because the scientists they're working on the data or so on and so forth, smart messaging would have been set to say, you know, we don't know how this is transmitted. So just to be safe, everybody wear a mask from the outset. 
because I think the more you have mixed messaging or changed messaging from healthcare professionals, the more it, it gives fodder to those who are naturally the anti-vaxxers, the anti-science uh, folks out there uh, to, uh, to you know, push their point of view and complain and just confuse people. So I think getting a better communication strategy set up. And then the third thing, as I say, I would say we've got to get out of, and this gets back to Sigmar's point about the whole world, we got to get out of this gravitational pull or resist the gravitational pull to nationalism that, that exists here. I mean, the United States immediately said no Europeans can come here, okay? And then in Europe, the Schengen zone stayed open during the refugee crisis, but boy, the minute this thing hit, you couldn't go from Austria to Germany, uh, you know, and, 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 I, I, and did that prevent, you couldn't go from Italy to Germany. Did that prevent uh, COVID from coming to Germany? Of course not. Did that prevent, did that travel ban prevent COVID from coming to the United States? Of course not. So I think um, we've got to be thinking more. This is a, an immediate global problem. You can't just shut down a particular area and forever isolate it. And we've got to come at it with global solutions. Thank you for that. There's a lot to learn from uh, the pandemic. I thank you all for your questions. Many of them we probably could address in, in, in variants and some we didn't. I don't know, Steve, if you have a solution for that, but I thank you for um, having me. I'm, I was, it was a very interesting discussion for myself and um, I wish you all well and stay healthy, please. Oh, a huge thanks to, to all three of you. This has really been a tremendous conversation, a very wide ranging conversation. And as Juliana pointed out at the outset, if we had had this discussion about two weeks ago, we probably would have focused much more on the nuances of the new German government. And of course, everything has been overshadowed by current events. And that's part of why today's conversation focused so much on Ukraine and on Germany's response. Um, Liba Zigma, dear John, Liba Juliana, this has been incredibly thoughtful and nuanced and very thought provoking. And I wanna thank the three of you for this conversation. But I also want to thank our viewers because we got a lot of questions from our viewers and I hope people picked up on the various threads that Juliana was trying to address with Sigmar and John. But there were a ton of questions about energy policy and Germany's energy policy in specific. And this actually kind of um, gives me an impetus to say I've been thinking a lot about how Germany has found itself in its current energy dead end. And that's the topic that we'd like to focus on at the ACG in, in an online event in the coming weeks, because this is a, a big question that a lot of people seem to be very interested in. So last but not least, I'd like to, to close by thanking our partners, Atlantic Brücke and the LA World Affairs Council and Town Hall for joining us for this event. Uh, we've had a great turnout and a great discussion, and I look forward to partnering again in the future. Until then, stay well, everybody. <laughs>